Today we're going to cover Chapter 1 of Community and Public Health, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. We're going to start off with some definitions, and then we're going to work towards the history of public health. Here are the objectives for Chapter 1. So after completing this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Determine, define the terms health, community, community health, population health, public health, public health system, and global health. Describe five major determinants of health. Explain the difference between personal and community health activities. List and dis discuss factors that influence community. Briefly relate the history of community and public health. Provide an overview of the current health status of Americans. Describe the purpose of the Healthy People 2020 goals and objectives. And summarize the major community and public health problems facing the United States and the world today. First, let's start out with some basic definitions. First, when we define health, right, most people will consider health the lack of any disease or the lack of illness. But the word health actually comes from the word hall, meaning whole. So in 1946, the World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. So early on, right way back then, they defined it as being physically, mentally, and socially well, which is how we describe it now, except we add even more factors. Right? Are you sexually well? Are you financially well? Are you spiritually well? Etc. So here in the dark, bolded font, we have the most robust definition that there is. So, quote, health is a dynamic state or condition of the human organism that is multidimensional in nature, a resource for living, and results from a peer's interactions with and adaptions to his or her environment. Therefore, it can exist in varying degrees and is specific to each individual in his or her situation. I know this is a long quote, but this is a very, very, very good quote. So let's start with the second word, right? Health is dynamic. This is exactly true, right? You don't just become healthy one day and then you're healthy forever, right? It's constantly changing. You can be really, really healthy and then get a cold and be out for a few weeks, right? Then you would be considered unhealthy, but that's not permanent. It also depends on your situation. If I have a broken arm, I can still be healthy, Right? Every single other part of me could be perfectly healthy. So a person can have a disease or injury and still be healthy or at least feel well. So for example, think of a Paralympic athlete. They might have some sort of physical condition or physical ailment, but they're still very fit. They're able to compete in competitive sports, right? So they are still healthy. Here we have the interconnections of determinants of health. So you can see in the five blue circles, those are the, the determinants of health. And this is a phrase you're going to hear constantly in this course and other courses related to health. Determinants means just a determining factor. Right? So in this case, let's look at the first one, gestational endowments. This means what you're born with, your genetic makeup. So this is a factor that determines your health, right? Therefore, it is a determinant of health. The other ones in the picture are social circumstances, environmental conditions, behavioral choices, which is what we usually think of when we think of health activities, and medical care. And we're going to break these down further as we go on. It is widely accepted that a health status is determined by the interaction of the five domains. Gestational endowments, your genetic makeup, social circumstances, your education, employment, income, poverty, housing, crime, and social cohesion. Environmental conditions, where people live and work, examples, toxic agents, microbial agents, and structural hazards. Right? Are you living in a location that has mold or is breaking down or wearing down? Do you have access to clean water? Or do you work in an area that's dangerous or hazardous? Your behavioral choices, which again we usually refer to as diet, physical activity, and substance use. And lastly, the availability of quality medical care. 
Okay, and the availability refers to two different things. First, do you have <laughs> locations close by that you can go to? Right? Do you have a dentist? Do you have a hospital? Do you have a doctor's office in your town? And then secondhand, it also refers to the quality. Right? Is it good? <laughs> Is it helpful? And then an extra third way to think about it is do you actually have access to it? Can you really afford to go? Right? Just because you have a doctor's office close by doesn't mean that you can just go there. Now we're going to move on to defining communities. So how would you define a community? Most people would say that it's a geographic area with specific boundaries, like a neighborhood, city, or county. But in the terms of public and community health, a community is, quote, a collective body of individuals identified by common characteristics such as geography, interests, experiences, concerns, or values. And we're going to go through and get more specific. So here are some common characteristics. One, membership. Two, common symbol systems, like a similar language, ritual, or ceremony. 3. Shared values and norms. 4. Mutual influence. 5. Shared needs and commitment to meeting them. And 6. Shared emotional con connection. Now usually with emotional connection we're referring to a similar experience. So here are some examples of communities. And this is a very useful slide so I recommend really reading this thoroughly. So first you could have the people of the city of Columbus, right? So this refers to people that live in a specific city. It's based on location. We have the Asian community of San Francisco, which again is focused on location. It's based in the city, but it also breaks it down into race. So specifically the Asian community. We also have, I'm going to skip a few here, the business or the banking communities. So that's based on your occupation the homeless of Indiana, which is a specific problem, right? We are talking about location in terms of state, but we're also talking about specific set of people that are homeless. Those on welfare in Ohio, which is a particular outcome, or those who are members of an electronic social network, and this is cyber, right? So we have lots of different communities in social media. Right? We have the people we follow, the people who follow us, the groups we're in, Right, etc. Types of health defined. So public health is considered actions that society takes collectively to ensure conditions in which people can be healthy. Now the public health system is the organized organizational mechanism of those activities undertaken within the formal structure of government and the associated efforts of private and voluntary organizations. So for example, we do a lot of work with the Center for Disease Control and local health departments. Community health is the health status of a defined group of people and the actions and conditions to promote, protect, and preserve their health. So for example, we've already talked about some types of communities, but if we want to focus on our town, then we're working on the health status of the people of Oxford, Mississippi. And if we want to get more specific, we can focus on the community health of undergraduate students at Ole Miss. And popu population health is more broader, and it refers to the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. Global health describes health problems, issues, and concerns that transcend national boundaries. It may be influenced by circumstances or experiences in other countries and are best addressed by cooperative actions and solutions. So global health addresses issues that are larger than just one single country. So some good examples include the Zika virus and COVID-19, which we're experiencing right now. So usually a global health issue starts in one location. It expands and then it's best solved by countries working together the rise in global health issues is due in part to the ease of traveling between countries. So it used to be more difficult to travel, right? but now we, as long as you can afford it, you can pretty much travel to any country you want. 
And since traveling is becoming more normal, we're exposing people to more diseases that they would not have been exposed to otherwise. Personal health activities are individual actions and decisions that affect the health of an individual or their immediate family. They usually, or they may be preventative or curative, but they usually don't affect anybody else. So some simple examples, such as eating a healthy diet, wearing a seatbelt while you're in a moving vehicle, and getting regular checkups. Now, typically, these don't affect other people, but sometimes they can. Right? If you're not wearing your seatbelt, you can impact or injure someone else in the vehicle with you or someone in a different vehicle. Community and public health activities are aimed at protecting and improving the health of a population or community. So these ones are a little more structural, right, and based on organizations. So for example, the maintenance of accurate birth and death records, the protection of food and water supplies. This can't usually be done on an individual level. Right? You might not have a lot of power over how birth records are stored. But when you have specific organizations that handle this, it can really improve the health of the community by being more organized and, you're, and therefore more able to track information. Here we have an image of factors that affect the health of a community. First, we have physical factors, social and cultural factors, individual behaviors, and community organization. Physical factors include the influence of geography, the environment, community size, and industrial development. In terms of geography, health of communities can be directly influenced by its altitude, latitude, and climate, right? where it is located geographically. In tropical countries where warm, humid temperatures and rain prevail throughout the year, parasitic and infectious diseases are a leading community health, problems, pro health problem. For example, if you think of malaria, malaria is a very prevalent disease, right? But it's not prevalent here in Mississippi, but it is in other locations. In more temperate climates like ours, with more than adequate food supply, obesity and heart disease are important community and public health issues. Now when we talk about the environment, the quality of our natural environment is directly related to the quality of our stewardship of it. In essence, the quality of our environment is determined by how well we treat it. If we continue to allow uncontrolled population growth and continue to deplete non-renewable natural resources, succeeding generations will inhabit communities that are less desirable than ours. Built environment refers to the design, construction, management, and land use of human-made surroundings as an interrelated whole, as well as their relationship to human activities over time. Some examples of a built environment include transportation systems, urban designs, facilities, housing, and roads. These are not here naturally, right? We impose them on nature. In terms of community size, the larger the community, the greater its range of health problems, but also the greater number of health resources it has. So for example, you might have more health professionals in a large city, right? Therefore, you probably have better health facilities. But, keeping with this example, in New York City, which has 8.5 million people, they generate more trash than the entire state of Wyoming, which has less than half a million people. So while they may have better hospitals, better trained doctors, they also have other things they need to deal with on a more regular basis, like keeping the streets sanitary and clean. Right? So there's always positive and negatives. This is really important to remember. Right? So while a small town might not have as much, as much access to medical professionals, they might have other strong qualities. Industrial development can have, an, have either a positive or negative effect on health. It can provide more resources, but also environmental pollution, occupational hazards, injuries, or illnesses. Communities with rapid industrial development must eventually regulate the way in which industries obtain raw materials, discharge byproducts, dispose of waste, 
treat and protect their employees, and clean up environmental accidents. Now we've seen this time and time and time again, that if you let the large industries just do whatever they want in a community, it usually is extremely harmful to the environment. And we're going to delve into this much later on in the semester when we focus on environmental health, but this is very important to be aware of. So most of the time when industries are acting unfairly, disposing of waste improperly, Right, it's usually in low socioeconomic areas, in essence, where the community is more poor. And usually, it is mostly made up of minority populations. Community organizing is the process by which community groups are helped to identify common problems or change targets, mobilize resources, and develop and implement strategies for reaching their collective goal. So community organizing occurs when the community sits down and says, we need to focus on this issue, whatever it may be. Okay. So sometimes it might be focusing on a drug problem. So how can they address that? Who, who do they need to get involved? And so on. Individual behaviors contribute to the health of the community also. So for example, if everyone recycled right, individually, the recycling pro program would be successful. If everyone wore their seatbelts, there would be less car accident fatalities. So individual behavior can also lead to herd immunity, which is the resistance of a population to the spread of an infectious agent based on the immunity of a high proportion of individuals. This is why scientists push so hard, and other health professionals, for, for individuals to get, get vaccines. Now we're going to to complete the second part of the presentation and focus on the history of community and public health. Here are the time periods we're going to cover. The earliest civilizations, Middle Ages, Renaissance, 18th century, 19th century, 20th and 21st century. During the earliest civilizations before 500 BCE, Archaeological findings provide evidence of sewage disposal and written medical prescriptions. This is fascinating. So at this time, communities were already properly disposing of their waste, meaning they knew that it could cause certain dangers or be hazardous, and they were also writing medical prescriptions. The earliest written record of public health was the Code of Hammurabi. This includes laws for physicians and health practices. It's extremely similar to the code of ethics we have today. For example, for doctors specifically, I mean. So for example, do no harm, right, is part of the code of Hammurabi. Greek men participated in games of strength and skill and also swam in public facilities. And they also practiced community sanitation. Romans built aqueducts, sewer systems, had regulations for buildings, and created hospitals. Here on the left you can see that it is an old stone. So this is the Code of Hammurabi, and it has been transcribed since then. And on the right you'll see a Roman image of two men completing what looks like boxing. Right? And you can see that they're physically fit. In the Middle Ages, or the year 500 to 1500 CE, Roman materialism and growth of spirituality was growing. Health problems were considered to have both spiritual causes and spiritual solutions. Therefore, this time was referred to as the spiritual era of public health. There was no account of the physical or biological environment and cause of communicable diseases. Therefore, many unrelenting epidemics occurred in which millions died. Now, communicable diseases, meaning they're contagious, they transfer from person to person. During 19, excuse me, 1348, the Black Death occurred and killed 25 million people. Half the population in London was lost, and in some parts of France, only one out of every 10 people survived. In the year 1200, there were more than 19,000 leper houses, where people that were suffering from leprosy would go to die. Other epidemics, such as smallpox, diphtheria, measles, influenza, tuberculosis, anthrax, and trachoma were also prevalent. 
In 1492, syphilis epidemic was the last epidemic of the period. And as you may know, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease. Here we have an image of the spiritual era. Okay, so you can see that we kind of have three ghost-like figures or evil spirits hovering over a city. And you can see what they say certain diseases. So the middle one says smallpox. The far one on the far right says leprosy. Okay. So this is a, just a graphic image representation of what they thought was occurring. They thought evil spirits would go around towns causing disease. And in order to get better, you had to somehow appease the spirits or get rid of the spirits. But during the Renaissance era, 1500 to year 1700, there was still the belief that disease was caused by environmental factors. Get vaccines. Now we're going to complete the second part of the presentation and focus on the history of community and public health. Here are the time periods we're going to cover. The earliest civilizations, Middle Ages, Renaissance, 18th century, 19th century, 20th and 21st century. During the earliest civilizations, before 500 BCE, Archaeological findings provide evidence of sewage disposal and written medical prescriptions. This is fascinating. So at this time, communities were already properly disposing of their waste, meaning they knew that it could cause certain dangers or be hazardous, and they were also writing medical prescriptions. The earliest written record of public health was the Code of Hammurabi. This includes laws for physicians and health practices. It's extremely similar to the code of ethics we have today. For example, for doctors specifically, I mean. So for example, do no harm, right, is part of the code of Hammurabi. Greek men participated in games of strength and skill and also swam in public facilities. And they also practiced community sanitation. Romans built aqueducts, sewer systems, had regulations for buildings, and created hospitals. Here on the left you can see that it is an old stone. So this is the Code of Hammurabi, and it has been transcribed since then. And on the right you'll see a Roman image of two men completing what looks like boxing. Right? And you can see that they're physically fit. In the Middle Ages, or the year 500 to 1500 CE, Roman materialism and growth of spirituality was growing. Health problems were considered to have both spiritual causes and spiritual solutions. Therefore, this time was referred to as the spiritual era of public health. There was no account of the physical or biological environment and cause of communicable diseases. Therefore, many unrelenting epidemics occurred in which millions died. Now, communicable diseases meaning they're contagious, they transfer from person to person. During 19, excuse me, 1348, the Black Death occurred and killed 25 million people. Half the population in London was lost, and in some parts of France, only one out of every 10 people survived. In the year 1200, there were more than 19,000 leper houses, where people that were suffering from leprosy would go to die. Other ep epidemics, such as smallpox, diphtheria, measles, Influenza, tuberculosis, anthrax, and trachoma were also prevalent. In 1492, syphilis epidemic was the last epidemic of the period. And as you may know, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease. Here we have an image of the spiritual era. Okay, so you can see that we kind of have three ghost-like figures or evil spirits hovering over a city. And you can see what they say certain diseases. So the middle one says smallpox. The far one on the far right says leprosy. Okay. So this is a, just a graphic image representation of what they thought was occurring. They thought evil spirits would go around towns causing disease. And in order to get better, you had to somehow appease the spirits or get rid of the spirits. During the years 1500 to 1700 CE, or the Renaissance era, the beliefs 
transitioned. So now people believe that disease was caused by environmental factors, not spiritual factors. This is when the term malaria starts being used. Now, malaria can be defined as bad air during this time. So mal means bad, area meaning air. So they began observations of the ill and identified distinct illnesses. So they recorded and distinguished the symptoms. So they would know, oh, it looks like you're suffering from this, for example, we'll say a common cold, which is caused by the bad air outside, right? Or bad air you breathed. But they didn't know anything else about them. They could just distinguish certain illnesses. Epidemics were still rampant, including smallpox, malaria, and the plague. And the plague epidemic killed almost 70,000 people in London in 1665. Explorers, conquerors, and merchants and their crews spread diseases to colonists and indigenous people throughout the New World. And here's where global health starts becoming an issue, right? People are bringing new diseases to new areas, and it kills thousands and thousands of people. Here we have an image depicting the plague going through a town. As you can see, it's pretty graphic. There are people just piled, dead bodies piled on each other. There's fires. looks like war. Right In the back left corner, it looks like a entire village is on fire. And there are skeletons representing death going all through town. Here we have another image that's pretty similar, right? bodies piled up, and a skeleton with a large weapon running through town killing people. This is a depiction of the plague. Now the 18th century was characterized by industrial growth. Living conditions were not conducive to health at all. Okay, cities were overcrowded, water supplies were often inadequate and often unsanitary. Streets were filthy, heaped with trash and garbage. Many homes also had unsanitary dirt floors. Workplaces were unsafe and unhealthy. Most of the workforce was poor. It included children who were forced to work long hours as indentured servants. So for example, textile factories and coal mines were serious, seriously hazardous locations to work. And this is still true today. Here we have an old image of an old textile factory. And you can see that there are quite a few people working on very hazardous machines. Here we have a supposed to be comic comical picture, but we have someone disposing of their waste, right? Bathroom waste, food waste, out onto the streets in France. And this was common practice. People would literally dump their their garbage outside of their windows. Now, in the 19th century, epidemics still continued, mostly in Europe and America. And in 1854, there was another cholera epidemic that struck London. John Snow hypothesized that the disease was caused by the drinking water in that town. Now, this is a very important time in public health. And on Blackboard, this YouTube video is linked, so I request that you go watch it. It's very insightful. And also during this time, miasma theory became popular, stating that vapors, or miasmas, were the source of many disease. This is very similar to the malaria idea, right? So you have literally bad air, bad vapors, causing diseases. Here is a picture of miasma trampling a town. In 1850, Lamuel Satuk drew up a health report from Massachusetts that outlined public health needs for the state. He recommended the establishment of boards of health, collection of vital statistics, and implementation of sanitary measures. So these sanitary measures may have included you know, keeping streets clean, keeping uh, excrement and other waste away from clean water, and the recording of vital statistics is important because you're gathering the literal health of the community, right? Who has what diseases? Does a certain part of the community suffer from a disease more than other parts? Maybe they're more exposed to some type of um, exposure, hazardous exposure. 
He also recommended that health education be implemented, control the exposure to alcohol, smoke, and adulterated food, and quack medicines. Now, adulterated foods <clears throat> refers to a specific additive they used to add to foods, and this was linked to poor health very early on. And quack medicine refers to fake medicine, such as drink this special water and you'll be cured of syphilis immediately. Okay. This is not anything new, right? We still have people that fall for these types of medicine now. Even some fad diets will, <laughs> I would refer to as quack medicine. And this marked the beginning of the modern era of public health. Right? They started getting organized and keeping record. This is what Lemuel Satuk looked like. In 1862, Louis Pasteur of France proposed his germ theory of disease. So through the 1860s, and that should say 1870s, he completed experiments and made observations that supported this theory and disproved previous theories, which was the theory of spontaneous generation. So before this, people thought right, that these diseases were just coming out of thin air, literally, right, and were caused by the air. But now he's proposing that germs might be a problem. So in 1876, German scientist Robert Koch demonstrated that particular microbes cause particular diseases. And this became known as the bacteriological period of public health. All right, so just to sum up really quickly, Robert Koch found that Specific germs or microbes cause specific diseases. Right? It's not just all germs cause all diseases. So most advances were made in Europe at this time, but the United States was also progressing. 1856, we had the first law prohibiting the adulteration of milk. Now, adulteration is something that still goes on with some products, but this is when you add specific items or additives called adulterants to types of food, and these adulterants have been linked to a lot of poor health outcomes. So in 1856, that's the first time they prohibited that. In 1864, we had the first sanitary survey of New York City. So when you're doing a survey, especially like a needs assessment, you'll go through the city, literally walk through it, and take note of where potential problems are or where current problems are, etc. In 1872, the American Public Health Association was founded, and that's still going strong today. In 1890, we began pasteurizing milk. In 1891, we began inspecting meat before selling it. And then in 1895 and 1899, nurses were hired to industries and schools, respectively. And then for our last example, in 1895, septic tanks were introduced for sewage treatment. So now we're on to the 20th century. Here, life expectancy was still less than 50 years. The leading causes of death were communicable diseases, excuse me, communicable diseases, ex including influenza, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and infections of the gastrointestinal tract, which most likely led to diarrhea and dehydration. Children were afflicted with diarrhea and bone deformity, for example, pellagra and rickets. Symptoms were known, but not the cause. So we could identify, for example, that a child had bone deformity due to rickets, which is from a lack of vitamin D. So we're identifying that it's rickets, they have sensitive bones, here are the issues they'll have, but we don't know why they have it yet. And the cause, which of course we later found out was vitamin deficiency, was slow to discover because scientists were focused on bacterial causes. Now this makes sense when we think about how we've progressed over the time. Right In the beginning we thought it was due to spirits, and then we thought it was due to the air, then we discovered bacteria, and right now we're just really, really focused on all the discoveries that we are still yet to make about bacteria. So we missed some vital diseases caused by lack of certain vitamins. So 1900 to 1960 is considered the health resources development period. And this is pretty simple, right? We're just developing better resources for health. So we had a large growth of healthcare facilities and providers, 
Now this time period can be broken down further into three phases. The reform phase, which was 1900 to 1920, the Great Depression, and World War II. Now during the Great Depression and World War II, most outcomes were, very, were slowed down. So there wasn't much progress happening at the national level. There were some medical there was some medical progress in, in terms of the military and within soldiers, but that wasn't in, introduced into the public until after the war. So the following period of time was called the period of social engineering. And this was 1960 to 1973. This is the first time that the federal government became active in health matters. In 1965, Medicare and Medicaid were established, and we had improved standards in health facilities. So we started writing code and getting all these facilities up to code, up to certain standards. And the influx of federal dollars accelerated the rate of increase in cost of health care. So this is when health care starts becoming more expensive. Now the last period that we'll cover is the period of health promotion. And this is still going on. So 1974 till now. This is when we first started discovering that premature deaths are traceable to lifestyle and health behaviors. So as I said before, most lifestyle factors that we're talking about are your diet, your physical activity levels, if you smoke, drink, or do any other drugs. So we're starting to realize that most of our deaths can be prevented from a healthy lifestyle. So therefore, we established the following three things, healthy people, Map it and the National Prevention Strategy. So I'll tell you a little bit about each of these in the following slides. So Healthy People is, is published every few years, okay? about every five to ten years. And Healthy People 2020 is the next one. So this is the federal government's prevention agenda for building a healthier nation. It is a statement of national health objectives designed to identify the most significant preventable threats to health and to establish nas national goals to reduce these threats. The vision of Healthy People 2020 is to have a society in which all people live long, healthy lives. The overarching goal of Healthy People 2020 are to attain high quality, longer lives, free of preventable disease, disability, injury, and premature death. They want to achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health of all groups, etc., etc. Okay, so this is written every few years. Scientists come together, establish if we've increased, decreased, met any goals, and then they write new ones for the following five years. The Map It framework was developed from Healthy People. So this was adapted from Healthy People 2020. This framework, otherwise known as MAPIT, can be used to plan and evaluate public health interventions to achieve Healthy Campus 2020 objectives. So this is just another framework that you can use to assess health. And MAPIT stands for Mobilize, Assess, Plan, Implement, and Track. The National Prevention Strategy. The Affordable Care Act was the impetus for creating the National Prevention Prevention Council, and its development of the National Prevention Strategy was to realize the benefits of prevention for a healthier America. So here are some of the specifics that they try to focus on, right? Creating healthy and safe environments, clinical and community preventative services, empowering people, eliminate disparities. And some of their priorities include tobacco, excessive drug abuse and alcohol use, healthy eating, active living, etc. Right, so these are the main things that we can control to reduce premature deaths. Now in the 21st century, so the U.S. community public health in the early 2000s was really focused on the delivery of health care, environmental problems, lifestyle diseases, communicable diseases, alcohol and other drug abuse, health disparities, disasters, and public health preparedness. So some of these you can imagine right now are extremely relevant, right? Public health preparedness would be the ability of the nation to respond to some impeding threat, right? For right, example, right now we're dealing with COVID and we could see that we have not been very prepared, right? So this initiative is to make sure we are prepared for whatever may happen. And this kind of encompasses natural disasters too. 
So world health in the 21st century, this is focused on the globe. These are our main things that we're focusing on. Okay. Communicable diseases, poor sanitation and safe drinking water, hunger, and migration and health. Now here are some of the things we have achieved globally. So these are very great things that we have done on a global scale. Okay, we've reduced child mortality, right? Where we've reduced the amount of children that die prematurely. We've reduced vaccine preventable deaths. We've increased access to safe water and sanitation. We have a better control of malaria prevention. We also have better prevention and control of HIV and AIDS. We have tuberculosis control, tobacco control, improved road safety, and improved preparedness and, resp and response on a global level. All right, so this is the end of this lecture, and here are some discuss discussion questions to think about. So how do you define health? Make sure that the that you encompass the total definition of health, right? It's not just not having a disease or an injury. It's being healthy on a holistic scale. How can understanding the history of community health efforts help today's planning? Okay, so how does knowing the past help us plan moving forward? How can healthy people documents affect health outcomes? And what role does the United States play in world health planning?